our second Utah Women in Leadership Project workshop of this academic year, and it's titled Writing for the Popular Press, a workshop for Utah women. I'm Dr. Susan Madsen, founding director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project and also the Karen Haid Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University, and I'm the host of the workshop today. So this event furthers the mission of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, which is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. We serve Utah and its residents by first, producing relevant, trustworthy, and applicable research. Second, creating and gathering valuable resources. And third, convening trainings and events that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. And our sponsors today are the John M. Huntsman School of Business and the Utah Education Network, UEN, for making this event possible. So I would like to introduce our two facilitators and presenters today. First, Holly Richardson. You can wave, Holly. <laughs> Holly Richardson loves many things and many people. She has been, been a columnist for the Salt Lake Tribune since January of 2017. She's a wife, mother, speaker, humanitarian, and world traveler. Her first academic degree was a registered nurse, and she later became a midwife then earned a bachelor's degree in communication focused on public relations, followed by a master's degree in professional communication. And she is now a third year PhD student in political science, focusing on nonprofit administration and international relations. Her research areas and interests include emotional labor, burnout and short-term uh, international humanitarian aid volunteers. She was also a member of the Utah House of Representatives and continues to stay politically active. Welcome, Holly. Thanks for joining us today. And Heather Sundahl is a writer and editor for the Utah Women in Leadership Project at Utah State University, Brigham Young University Arts, and Mormon Women for Ethical Government. She received a BA in humani Humanities and an MA in English from BYU, her passion is women's stories. In pursuit of this, she has worked with the Exponent 2 for 23 years as a contributor, blogger, editor, retreat presenter, and president. Heather has traveled to Botswana. Is that how you say it? Botswana. Botswana yeah. And South Africa to interview and collect stories of sister saints with the Mormon Women Oral History Project. She lives in Provo with three of her four kids, two cats, and one husband. So good to have you both here, and I'll turn it right over to you, and we'll get going on the workshop. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Susan. So um, I'm going to get started and first um, talk a little bit about why we write, and then I will go into letters to the editor, um, and how we submit. But first, I, I thought this was so interesting. So um, when I started working with Susan and she had me sort of figuring out op-eds, I just assumed that the op meant opinion. I had no idea. I had no idea what op-ed meant. And so I had to do research on it. So here's, here's the background. So in 1970, it's only 50 years old, the New York Times, they launched the very first modern, it's opposite of the editorial page. So the editor on one side would have their editorial and then on the opposite side, um, contributors, just people, they could write in with letters to the editor. And so it, it literally means, it literally means opposite, but also often opposite metaphorically in response to. So anyhow, if you're wondering what op-ed uh, means, that's, that's what it's all about. So let me, um, okay, so why write? Like what, you know, why do we care? What does it matter? So one of the first things for me is that it really can raise awareness. So a lot of times we write because there is something that, that we feel deeply about that we want people to know. And so when you're thinking about your writing, what are your passions? What are the things that you really care about? Because um, it doesn't all have to be political. I think sometimes we think that, um, letters to the editor and op-eds always need to be political. I mean, they need to involve more than just ourselves, but it doesn't just have to be about, about politics. Um, another reason why we write is to create change. 
So here's another study that I thought was fascinating. So at Yale University, they found that op-ed pieces have a lasting effect on people's views, regardless of their political affiliation or their initial stance on an issue. So people read an argument and they were persuaded by it. It's that simple. So while 50% of the people in the control group agreed with the views expressed in an op-ed, 65 to 70% of the people in the treatment groups, they expressed agreement with the authors immediately after the piece. And then the gap between the control and the treatment groups closed by about half after 10 days. But that still means that's still a substantial amount of people who were, whose minds were actually changed by op-eds and letters to the editors. So it really does have a lasting effect. I mean, sometimes we think, oh, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares what I think. No one, you know, if I do this, it, you know, only my mom will read it. Nobody will care. Well, it's not true. Pe people do care and it, and it can change minds. Another one is that it really empowers yourself and others. So I have found that using your voice makes you feel like you're really doing something. Even if it doesn't change anything, you can still look in the mirror and know I said something. I stood up for what I thought was right. And so it really makes a difference. And it also is a way of encouraging others to do the same. People say, I saw that you wrote that. Will you help me write something? I mean, people have things that they want to say. And it, it's, it's very empowering. One of my jobs right now is I run the op-ed lab for Mormon Women for Ethical Government. So people will send me in little ideas or sometimes drafts of letters to the editor and, and people are scared. People are nervous. They, they, they always sort of start out and Susan, this is a total woman thing. And I know you're, you're always, you know, we're always apologizing for ourselves. We're always, Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, like someone gives you a compliment. You're like, Oh no, my hair looks terrible today. You know, our first impulse is somehow to, you know, negate ourselves. And so, um, and then when people actually go through this process, the difference between their initial attitude and then after they've done it, whether or not they get published, it, there's a huge difference. So I know that writing is really empowering. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go into the basic difference between op-eds and letters to the editors. Op-eds are like 500 words, no more than 800. You're usually a little more of an expert, an opinion piece, um, they have an agenda. Um, you often have sources, whereas letters to the editor, they're 150 to 300 words. They're a lot shorter. And you do not need to be an expert. They're very topical. Um, they can be urging, they can be criticizing, or they can be praising. And I think we sometimes don't get enough of the ones where people praise, where they um, write in and talk about something that, that the town or state or the community is doing really well. All right, so here are some basic tips for writing a letter to the editor. Um, number one, stay current. So you wanna focus on breaking news, you wanna to respond to something um, in the paper or your community from the last couple days. And because if you're not current, then nobody really cares. It just, you know, Holly and I were talking about this. I think she said that she worked with someone who spent days and days and days working on something. And by the time they finally submitted it, it was like old news, you know, it just, you, you've got to be current. So, um, and part of this staying current, I think a, one thing that, that I do is that you get a type of feel for the letters to the editor that are out there. And some of them are, some of them are really amazing and they're going to intimidate you, but a lot of them you're going to read and you're going to think I could do that. I mean, most of them are just written by normal people. So, and, and for me, that's, that's comforting to know, you know, I could do that. So you also want to um, know your audience. So read the paper that you want to submit something to and read the letters, kind of get a feel for, um, for what they're like. I mean, if it's a really conservative paper, then a progressive diatribe might not fly. They might not even publish it. So, um, and if you are going to do something that pushes against the sort of vibe of the paper, then you have to kind of find sneaky ways to do it. So for example, I wrote an op-ed um, promoting, urging people to pass the ERA. And I reminded people that the Utah constitution has an equal rights clause. So that was my way of saying, 
we can't act like this is a big, scary, foreign thing when we actually have one ourselves. And so um, we want to keep those things in mind. And Holly and I, we also talked about this, embrace good enough. Perfect is the enemy of getting anything done. So if you keep working on it until your letter is perfect, you are going to miss your moment. So read it out loud, have a friend, friend proofread it, and then hit send. So um, next, when you're sitting down to write, focus on one thing. You've got to just pick a single issue and go for it and let your passion show. So you need to just jump right in. Every word counts. When you have 150 to 300 words, there is no time to say things like, well, I think dot, 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 because you're saying it. Everyone knows that it's you who thinks it. So you just, you just dive in and you want to avoid those phrases that take up space and don't mean anything like throughout history. So just, just dive in. Um, I really think it's important to include an action item. So um, if you're writing about something, what do you want people to do about it? I mean, we can complain until eternity comes and back and still be complaining, but what should people do about it? So I think it's important if you bring up a problem, then you really need to sort of clearly identify um, a solution. Um, another really good tip with, with letters to the editor is that a lot of people feel more comfortable writing a member of Congress. So let's say we're talking about the post office and we really wanna keep the post office around. We wanna keep it supported and functioning. Um, you could write Mitt Romney a letter, you know, as one of your Congress, you could write Mitt, you could write local people. You, this is you know, something that you could do and that's effective. But Mitt Romney may never see that. His staff may never forward it. But if you write a letter to the editor and in it you say, and I urge you, Senator Romney, to think about this issue, they have their Google Alerts set up just like we do. And so his staffers, anytime one of these Cong members of Congress are mentioned in the news, in the paper, they get an alert. So they will not only see it, but they will know that lots of other people have seen this letter. And um, sort of the, the older generation tends to also like to read the papers and read these letters to the editors and the elderly always vote. A lot of the young people, they talk, 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 but they don't always vote. But the um, older people tend to vote. And so that's a really good way to sort of maximize what you're saying. Okay, um, another point, be yourself. Put away the, 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 the thesaurus and don't be afraid to show your personality. And, and this is something that Holly is so good at doing. This is why I'm really a fan of Holly's work is because she just, she shows who she is. She does not apologize. There's just so much flavor and color in, in her work. Um, and I, I really, I really enjoy that. So don't, uh, and, and as yourself, own whatever your authority is. You don't have to have a PhD in child psychology to make a statement. I mean, you can say as a parent of three teenagers and then whatever your point is. So claim the authority that you do have. So, or if it's air pollution, you don't have to have a PhD in you know, biology. You can just say, as someone with asthma who runs daily, my lungs can attest dot, 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 whatever it is. So use your experience, even if you don't have expertise. Um, and don't be afraid to say I. I think a lot of us were trained in our high school English classes that you somehow can't say I, that these papers, these ideas are disembodied and they just sort of flow from, you know, the nebulous universe and you're not allowed to say I. Use, use I. You are yourself. You are you. You use I. Skip the passive voice. Own the action. Um, and you can't be bold without being a jerk. I know that a lot of us women, we are afraid. Well, it's not just that we're afraid of being perceived as overly aggressive or angry or this and that. It's that if my husband makes one statement, he is perceived one way. If I make the exact same statement, I may be perceived differently because I'm a woman. And so it, it's not just that we're afraid people may think these things. It's, it's that there is some validity, but I really do assert that we can be bold, that we can make statements, we can make claims, 
and, and just own it, own it. We've got to learn to be more confident about um, our opinions. So um, in these letters, you know, so we're expressing what we care about and, but sometimes you have to tell other people why they should care. So if I want to get some local bond pass so that they can rebuild Tint View High School so that big pieces of the roof don't fall down and hit my daughter while she's in class, um, how am I going to address my aunt who's 86 and all her eight kids are grown up and she's like, I don't want to pay for a bond. I need to, you know, say, and property values will go up if we have a good school. So you need to think about why other people should also care. Um, and then keep submitting. So if you submit it to the Deseret News and they reject you, um, you can submit it to the Tribune only one at a time. You can't submit multiple. <laughs> you just, it's like, it's like a prom date. You can only say yes to one person at a time and then if that falls through, then you go get yourself another date. So, um, and there, there are a lot of places that we can publish. Um, Susan and I sometimes, sometimes joke, you know, like, all right, send it to the Linden leaflet, you know? Like if you can't send it to, if a big publication doesn't want it, keep trying, keep trying to um, find a venue that will take it. Because a lot of these littler places, they are so excited to have original work. I mean, they're, they're just, they're hungry for it. They're, they're hungry for it. And you can do a Google search and find all sorts of places online that um, in your, in your communities that'll do it. So. And Heather, yeah. Heather, you know, that's that. Um, and Kylie's on here. And if Kylie can take a note, I just think we do have a little list on our website, but it doesn't have too many like links, maybe some of the big papers. But your comment just thought, you know, we'll we'll have a volunteer work on yeah. putting maybe all because there's a lot of the Highland paper, sure. the Linden paper, the Lehigh. Yeah. Free so press. so let's we'll do that for and then maybe send it out um, either in our newsletter in um, you know in November or December so that most of you are on our newsletter. So let's do that. I like that. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, yeah, and like I say, they're they're really they're really hungry for it. And something else that um, so Jordan Carroll, she was the editor of the Daily Herald and the Standard Examiner, and we just loved her. I mean, she was just she was amazing, and she came and did a workshop similar to this about a year ago um, at at UVU. And one of the things that she said that really really stuck with me is that most of the things that are published are by men. Most of the voices are, are by men. Um, and that these papers are hungry for women's voices. They, they really are. They, the fact that you're a woman, I think is gonna be to your advantage is, is that a lot of these papers, um, I mean, we all, we all know that, that um, I mean, what's that, what's that study, Susan? It's the Hewlett Packard one where um, they, they found that when they sent out a job application that men would apply for it if they thought they were at least 50% qualified. Yeah, yeah. But women felt like the word requirement actually meant requirement. And so women would not apply for these jobs unless they sort of could check off every single every single box. And the same, I think, is true in politics is that a lot of women, they're like, well, I don't fully know all the issues. And so I can't jump into the ring. Whereas a lot of men are just more inclined, like, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for this. Like, I don't know everything. That's okay. And that women, we feel like we have to sort of know everything, be totally confident and have all of this information. And the truth is that most of us have sufficient information and sufficient um, what it takes to put ourselves out there and do these things. Like we don't, we don't have to be a hundred percent. It's fine. Whatever you've got, run with it. And, and that's, I think, really important and keep submitting. So you can, like I say, you can keep getting smaller and smaller. And I, I look this up, I, you know, you hear these things, they seem like they're kind of urban legend or whatever, but 
It's a fact that J.K. Rowling submitted the Harry Potter manuscript 12 times and it was rejected. 12 times before it was accepted. And so not that, you know, my op-eds or letters to the editors are quite on the par, on par with um, the Harry Potter series, but I think it just shows you that um, you can't totally take it personally. When somebody rejects it, the next person may be so excited for it. And so you just, you need to be willing to um, just keep going. And if worse comes to worse, put it on your Facebook feed, whatever you've written, and you will get validation from your friends. And it may actually help you hone and refine your ideas. And you're still making a difference. You're still making change and modeling um, this important thing of, of speaking your truth and claiming your voice. So those are my tips for um, op-ed. I mean, excuse me, for letters to the editor. So I, um, I wanted to talk a little bit and, and piggyback on what Heather has said, but also when we um, come back from our first small breakout session, that's only gonna be five minutes, but I wanna, we, we will both address um, some of the fear things that keep us from submitting, right? Um, and what to do with haters, because if you say anything that has any kind of strong opinion, um, you're gonna get people who disagree with you and some don't disagree kindly. So, so op-ed, like, like Heather said, it used to be, we use it more generically now, but it used to be that you were specifically publishing something uh, in opposition to what the editor of that paper has said. So I, I think one of the things for me as I have written now for almost four years, I'm right at the 250 column mark. They're, they're not, mine are a little different. So they're, they're columns which can be op-eds, they can be strong opinion pieces and sometimes they're um, this is just what Holly thinks, right? Or Holly's um, experience. But I shared recently about the Salem witch trials and I have a ninth great grandmother who was burned at the stake as a witch in Salem and, um, and, and, and really how that ties into today's um, political atmosphere. But like Heather also said, it does not have to be about politics. Um, I will tell you for the Salt Lake Tribune, they want you to stick at 600 words. So on this slide, it says 500 to 700, but they're really like, they're not gonna publish really if you go over 600. Um, I've very rarely gone to the 700 mark and I've very rarely gone under 600. So I'm somewhere in that six to 700 range every week. So when you write these letters, one of the things that I think is different from what you learned maybe in high school or even your college writing classes is you don't start with, you know, kind of this outline of what you're going to discuss, really. You start with the hook. You start with a personal story. You start with um, a quote. You start with something that's, that's attention grabbing because as you know, the way we consume news has changed. And even if you've watched the news this week, uh, about the two major newspapers in Utah, both of them are getting away from print editions um, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. They're going to weekly and, uh, and it's just changing, right? The nature of the, of the traditional media is changing. And so A, you're gonna always want to have something that is emailed, like don't send it in an envelope. It's not gonna do, nothing's gonna happen if you do that. But, but B, it's, it's you want to grab people as they're scrolling by on their devices, right? On their phone, on their iPad, tablet, whatever. You want some kind of opening statement that makes them stop and say, whoa, wait, what? Um, so that they take the time to read it. And I think um, if you are on Twitter at all, they have an interesting brand new feature where if you try to retweet an article that you have not clicked on, and you've only read the headline, they invite you to read the article <laughs> before, before you click on it. And, and I'm, I'm many times have people respond to the headline of my article um, that has, has not actually read the article. And it's pretty clear in the arguments that they're making to me that they haven't actually read it. So, so you wanna start with something really strong and then you can build your case for it below that rather than the reverse of um, a lot of our um, college writing or even high school writing where you're leading up to a strong conclusion. This is like the reverse. You flip it, flip it around. So you don't have to have, um, I'll reiterate what Heather said. You do not have to have some kind of formal authority to comment. 
Um, but you do want to claim the authority that you do have. So you're a mom to teenagers, you're, um, you, you are a professor, you deal with students, you're a teacher in the public school system, um, you're a parent of a child with disabilities and these policies personally affect you. You can also cite and link sources. This is nothing formal really, but if you're saying um, that you're talking about this, you know, really interesting new study that you just read, then you are gonna to want to include an email hyperlink um, to that study or to that amount of research, that research. And <clears throat> you wanna ask, you wanna answer the reader's question, why should I care? And it's, I think one of the things too that I have seen with <clears throat> some letters that get published, but many letters don't get published. Most letters don't get published. Most op-eds don't get published. And one of the reasons is because there is not a well-structured argument. It really is just a diatribe. So if you are feeling really strong emotions and they're, it's coming out in um, colorful language and name calling, they're probably not gonna publish that. But what you can do is take that passion and that energy and, and you can write stuff down. You can do a, a brain dump on your, on your page if you want, and then come back a little bit later and clean it up and say, okay, why is it that I had such a strong emotional response to this, right? And then you can craft that into an op-ed or into a letter. Um, you do need to understand that the headline probably will not be the one that you send your letter in with. And, and that's okay, but understand that it, it may be turned into clickbait. It may be something where it's really quite different than what you were intending, but do your best to structure your argument so that it matches the headline that you, um, that you pick. And, and then hopefully when people read it, they can understand what you're trying to get to. You don't have the space and 600 words to have a lot of fluff. Um, you also, in op writing op you to stick to just one topic and, and make your argument around that topic. And then be succinct in your writing, right? So if you are, um, let me think, I'm trying to think of one that I did recently that uh, raised ire. Anytime I write something from, say, a Republican point of view that supports a, a, a Republican candidate, um, I don't I don't write pieces necessarily that support specific candidates, but I will call people out for, say, um, inciting division, right? And I wrote one during the legislative session that asked a Republican senator to check his privilege at the door. Um, that one got a lot of response as I knew it would. I had private messages telling me that I was um, really inappropriate and not mean and I was a really bad Republican and I um, will own the bad Republican. I'm not a very good one right now. It depends on who you compare me to, I suppose. Um, but, but I will say this, right, is I knew that it would get a response and it did. Um, the, the particular issue at the time was um, a Senator who said that because his mom made his lunch for school or made his breakfast before school and his wife made his kids breakfast before school, we should not uh, pay for breakfast at, for kids at school. So clearly he didn't have an issue with a single parent household or a parent who had to be at work early, early morning hours or you know a variety of reasons, but, but uh, my, my whole premise was that he needed to check his privilege and that got um, a lot of people going as I expected that it would. So, so you wanna also make sure that as you tailor your arguments, you're talking to um, the reader, the average reader, a general reader. So you may have specific inside knowledge, but you don't wanna be using jargon, right? You don't wanna be going, um, <clears throat> and using all kinds of fancy language to show how much you know. So this is, um, I really like this quote because it really kind of gets to the heart of storytelling, which is really what you're trying to do. That's the hook, right? Don't tell me the moon is shining, show me the glint of light on broken glass. Um, so, so you wanna avoid jargon and technical specificity, right? Th things that, that may seem totally normal to you, but you're in your little uh, niche market. You want to write to an eighth grade level. If you were teaching a junior high class or talking to a junior high class, could they understand what you're talking about? Um, you also want to be unique, right? So if you're if you're writing an article, for example, we'll pick the pandemic, right? If you're writing an article about COVID-19, what unique take do you have on that? What hasn't already been said 25 times, maybe 2,500 times? 
um, what is different about your approach and why is it interesting? So you may have, um, I, I think as we're coming into holiday season, you may be able to write something about Thanksgiving dinner during a pandemic, or what do you do for Christmas gifts, or you know, how do you how do you shift your traditions during the times of pandemic, something like that, right? But you want to do something that's unique and that hasn't already been done, like I said, a whole bunch of times. Um, you want to be a storyteller, and and I remember one of the people that came and asked me for some input on um, an op-ed that they were writing that they were not able to get published. Um, it, it was really interesting research, but there was no applicability. So it was um, interesting information without a hook. And talking to her about, do you know somebody who's actually experienced this? This happened to be some information about domestic violence. Do you know somebody who has lived through this? Do you know somebody whose story, even if you can't use a specific story, can you aggregate some stories, right? And talk about some of the clients that I work with go through things like this, right? Or you can say Shannon, not her real name, um, those types of things. So, so that's how you pull your reader in. And then you can share the facts and figures, but a lot of times they're boring just by themselves. And then um, use humor. So can you, can you call people out? right, in, in a way that's kind of lighthearted. So I saw one, um, a, a, an opening statement from someone who was an obstetrician who said, I'm an OBGYN and I know that the, um, you know, I know processes usually take months. So I was really surprised to see this bill, you know, rushed through in like two weeks or something, whatever it was, right? So, so are, you, are you able to tap into some of that or can you use irony? Um, but don't be afraid to call people out when needed, right? And that's that's back to the Senator check your privilege at the door um, because I had a specific thing that I wanted to have happen, which was revisit a bill. And that is what happened actually in the bill was passed instead of killed in committee. But but it's those types of things and you can do it in a way without name calling, right? You, you, if, you're, if you're writing and you're, you know, you don't want your kids to hear what names you're calling them, you probably ought to edit. Um, before you send it. And, and, and Heather said, and I agree mostly, Heather said, if, sit on your, um, write your, your piece, have somebody read it over, make sure you, know, you don't have a bunch of typos, and then send it off. And I will have one extra caveat. If it's particularly emotional, um, I sometimes will sit on it um, several hours, sometimes overnight, right? So that I can um, sit on that piece and Sometimes I'll have my husband read it and say, okay, like, I understand some people are going to get angry about this, but have I been able to lay out an argument that's not just, you know, an attack? Is this something that, um, that actually makes sense? Um, and he helps me with that. So the one article that I had at the Trib that went viral in a really big way, meaning um, I had the, the most commented article I ever had was like the third one I ever wrote. <laughs> and, and it was um, it was after a Republican lobbyist had told um, a gathering that Republicans who did not vote for Trump in 2016 should repent for their vote. And um, I wrote an article that said, no, you don't need to repent, right? If you voted for somebody different than, than Donald Trump. And that thing just went, it just exploded. I, you know, but but it's one that I made sure that I didn't. I wasn't imputing motive on the lobbyist. I wasn't taking his words and adding my um, interpretation of what he said. I had exact quotes from what he said um, and put it in there and then added my take, which is you didn't need to repent for your vote. Um, either way, like it doesn't, you don't have to repent in my opinion for the vote that you make. So, so that's one that I sat on for a little while and it had over a thousand comments and people were really angry and that's okay, right? That's okay. Um, and I think that's one of the things as we talk um, in a few minutes, one of the things we'll talk about is um, people who are really unhappy with what you write and, and, and what to do about that. And I'll tell you my number one tip right now is that I never read the comments. So I, I think the comment sections in online media, no matter where it is, I don't read the comments on the trib on my articles. I read my comments on social media. I read my comments on Twitter and Facebook where I share my articles. I read those, I respond to those. 
Um, <clears throat> and, and I have um, just a pretty firm rule that I don't jump into the comment section. I, I do break that rule every once in a while, but it's rare. And, and a lot of times, Greg, my husband will jump on and he'll say, yeah, you've got some real haters. I'm like, I know. <laughs> um, so I have a couple of questions from the chat that I want to go ahead and address. One from Catherine, she asks um, about strategies to select which publications that you should submit to. And, and, and some of the strategy is where is it going to be published, right? Where are your people? Where are they reading? And what kind of uh, reach does the publication have that you're aiming for? So I have never been published in the New York Times. And honestly, I've never tried. I've never submitted anything to them. I've been quoted a time or two by them, but I've never submitted anything for publication in the Times. Um, they, they, they do have a very high bar and they get many, many submissions. So I would rather go somewhere where they were actually published and then you can link to a publication. And, and what Heather said as well, you can put it on your Facebook page, but you can also publish on medium.com. And that seems to be a really good place for people to go ahead. And it, it's kind of like a community blog, right? So blogging, I used to be a blogger. I used to have a political blog called Holly on the Hill. And I think that's where I started to really hone my ability to, um, to share succinctly and to, to not be afraid of a, putting out strong opinions, but B, I had to be able to back it up. I couldn't just toss stuff out there because I promised there were people who would immediately come back and say, yeah, well, you know, that's not true. Um, what about this? What about this? What about this? And so I became a much better writer um, because of that. But I would start where you think you can get published and um, where your audience is, right? If you, you feel free to publish in the Deseret News and Salt Lake Tribune, so send pieces to them. Um, but also don't be afraid of the small, um, the smaller papers, like Heather said, they really are looking for content and especially in a dying industry, let's be honest, um, they need additional content, you can use medium.com, but to be published in, in the New York Times or the Washington Post, um, that's going to take something, you know, really unique, um, a unique take, very well written and submitted in a very timely fashion. Um, okay, Marcy asked me if publications actually tell you that your letter or your op-ed is rejected or not going to be published? And the answer is no, not usually they don't, right? So, so how long do you wait? It just depends. Um, you can shoot them an email and, and ask if you can submit to another publication. They may or may not respond. But I would say by the time you realize they're probably not going to publish it, you're, you've probably missed your window for that one. But I would say be aggressive. Like if you send something to the Trib and 24 hours later, you haven't heard anything, I would send an email and say, hey, you know, I sent something in yesterday. I've got some other, you know, you can kind of play this game where you're like, I've got, you know, some other places that I know will publish it. Let me know. Or, you know, and, and sometimes you can even say, if I don't hear from you by the end of today. I'm going to take it somewhere else. Yeah. Um, and sometimes you have to kind of, be a squeaky wheel. I mean, and sometimes they'll say they're going to take it and then it doesn't show up for a long time. And you know, even Susan will have to do this where, where she'll have to be like, hey, hey, remember you told me that this was going to come out this weekend and it didn't come out. You know, you have to follow up with people. And the news cycle is not what it used to be. You know, now it's 24 seven, it's around the clock and you may have some breaking news that just interrupts. Yeah, that bumps it. it is. Yep. And, and by the time they get back around to it, it's not timely anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that, and that's okay too. Right. So there's some things that are considered evergreen content. Like it's always applicable. It's always interesting. Um, air quality in Utah in, you know, January, February is always something that's, that's um, applicable. So you can pre-write something there and then just tweak it as it gets closer. But there are some things that, that they just like it peaks and then it's gone. Holly, um, um, Holly yeah. no, just real quick to tell people we in the work that we've been doing, we've found that, I mean, there's some good readership in the Daily Herald and mm -hmm. in the Ogden Standard and also in uh, the Spectrum, St. George Spectrum, if it's a really statewide kind of issue. So everything is not just about the Salt Lake Tribune or the, the sure. Desert News. It's true. And I've got a friend who's the editor up in Ogden and he is always looking for content as well. So, um, okay. I, um, 
I have a question from Stacy who asks if I have ever had a negative reaction and seen repercussions um, in my professional life. So once I have, um, I got threatened with a, a lawsuit, actually a defamation lawsuit for something that I wrote in the paper. And um, the reality is because I had, I, I felt confident that if it ever went to court, which it never did, but I felt confident that if it did, that, that I was covered under the first amendment because I sourced everything. I was not defaming the person that I was writing about. I was um, in fact sourcing things that she had done from other places besides just my own head. Um, but you do have to be careful, right, sometimes. So when I was a legislator, I had people who would send me stuff. I mean, talk about trying to write persuasively, right? So clearly it was a form letter. Um, I had gotten 200 copies of it and then they had added like at the bottom and they were, it was all just telling me what a horrible person I was. And then at the bottom, it was like, okay, and we have this bill and we want you to vote for the bill, right? And, and of course I'm a human being and so are the other legislators. And so our response is if there's any way to not vote for this bill, we're not gonna vote for this bill, right? Cause you just called us a whole bunch of names. <laughs> I learned new words um, when I was a legislator and, and I had some people who threatened to kill me but I didn't take them seriously enough to um, report them. But there are some things where it can be dangerous. And um, I, I would say, you know, you want to be wise, right? You're just writing um, an, an op-ed and you, you can have professional repercussions depending on your environment and who your boss is. So I, um, I worked full-time one year, a few years ago for an organization that did not appreciate my um, ability to have influence outside of work. And I had agreed to sit on a panel for women, um, LDS women, and uh, an issue of the day. And this has been probably eight years. And uh, it was after hours. Um, it was you know, on my own time. And yet my boss came to me and said, if you sit on this panel, you'll be fired on the spot. And they meant it. <laughs> so, so I did not sit on that panel. Um, and then I quit about a month later. Um, so, okay, so that, um, somebody's asking about pseudonyms. Do you wanna write with pseudonyms? Uh, my, my personal take is no, but, but there are a number of people who write um, under pseudonyms because it's safer, right? Or they can get a broader audience, right? So JK Rowling wrote with the initials because um, it she she has a feminine name. I think it's Julie, Julia, Joan. What is it, Heather? Joan. 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 And, and her editor said, you know, this is not going to, your name alone is not going to appeal to um, teenage boys and we want them to read this book. Right, so, so there's a number of reasons, but look, you can find, you can pretty much find anything on the internet. I don't try to hide. I don't hide my address. I don't have my phone number. It doesn't take long to find those anyway. But again, again, you wanna be careful, right? If, you, if you're writing in and you need to write anonymously, there are newspapers, they will take them anonymously. They will publish them anonymously. They don't take them anonymously. So you need to sign your name. You need to have your phone number um, that, so that they can talk to you, make sure it's accurate. But um, there are times where you can say, I am a teacher in XYZ school district. We've been told that if we talk about this topic, we could be fired, but I'm seriously concerned and this is why. And then they'll just publish it, right? They, they, they are, there are papers who will publish it um, and to, to say, you know, they'll protect your identity because there could be repercussions. And we're already at time um, to hop into Oh, this is uh, how to submit really quickly. So you want to find out the requirements for your word count and the email addresses. And then you, in your subject line, you want to be really clear about what it is. And then you copy and paste your whole article or your letter into the body. They will not open an attachment. They just don't do it. And then include your contact information. Okay. All right. We're going to break into small groups and we're, we're only going to have a few minutes, uh, about five minutes. But I want you to brainstorm in your groups um, potential topics that you can write about this week. And so 
so really, uh, you have an opportunity to just look at the news headlines from the last few days, and you can see things like um, the D News and Trib are going uh, to weekly only um, print publication. You can see uh, Mike Lee um, talking about Captain Moroni. You can see the pandemic and Halloween. You can see that the Jazz, Utah Jazz was sold. I mean, those are all things that you can talk about. Um, and Susan is going to help us get into little groups, and we'll be back um, in just a few minutes. I wanted to, so one of the things um, that I wanted to do is, is share this little email exchange that I had with a woman that I was working on an op-ed with her, because I think it shows sort of the process of, of how things can happen. And, um, and it, it, at least for me, I, it was really, it, I think it captures a lot of, a lot of what goes on. So I'm going to do a screen share. I've never done this before. We'll see if this works. Okay. So can you see yeah. this? Can you see this? Okay. Um, okay. Just, all right. So the first email is where she says to me, I'm in Nevada. Some people from MWEG recommended I write to you. I haven't done anything like this since I wrote editorials for high school 30 years ago. It was a good experience. It challenged me. And then she's basically saying, be honest. I know it's awful. You can tell me it's garbage, you know, because we're insecure. I mean, unless you've gone to school for journalism or something like that, then we're all novices at this. So then we have some exchanges back and forth where we work on the editing, where I validate her. It's good because it was good. So then she gets to the point where she's ready to send it off. And so she says, I'm pleased with it. Switching sentences helped. I'm having a hard time to send, deciding whether to send it to the Sun or the Independent. You know, the Sun is more local. And then she says, do I submit it to both at once? See which one takes it. Do I choose? And so then I had to email her back and say, you have to pick one. You can't do both, so choose one. So she decided to send it to the independent. And then she, they rejected it. She's like, I got this letter. Thank you much for thinking of us. We appreciate it. it even though it's well-written, it's not gonna work for us. And then she says, I was disappointed, but when I think about it, I can't remember reading any op-eds that weren't Nevada-centric. So that makes sense. I'll try not to take it personally. So she gets a rejection. She puts herself out there with me and then she puts herself out there again and, and she's rejected and she's scared. And I'm like, then, but she went ahead. She said, I did submit it to the sun, but it was after five. So they have, I haven't gotten a response. Hopefully they'll take it. And then the fourth email, she's like, great news. I just heard back from the sun. They're going to publish my op-ed Saturday. I wish it were before then, but I'll take what I can get. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for all of your help. Mm -hmm. And it, it just was so exciting to see this sort of transformation over time. And it was because she chose to use her voice. It's because she chose to put herself out there and share some opinions that, that she was afraid weren't gonna be popular, that, that the paper might be like, we completely disagree. And she has now shared this on her personal page. And I've watched all sorts of people rise up and validate her. And, and I would be so surprised if she doesn't do it again. I mean, I look at it and I think she is gonna, she now has found her voice. She's seen how satisfying it is. And she is gonna do this again. And it's, it's really exciting. I can, so Holly's training was as a midwife. I consider myself like an essay, an op-ed midwife where, you know, people kind of come to me with these ideas and, you know, and, and we kind of do this, this dance back and forth, trying to me, trying to help them kind of give birth to this thing. Heather, you could make a lot of money if you charged. <laughs> <laughs> can't do it for free because you believe in it so much and you're so gifted so from from me and other people thank you for your service uh and it's community service isn't it well, i do i do consider it community service I, I i think this this is sort of how how i you know in the pandemic like i can't I can't go help refugees like I used to. I mean, there's so many things that I used to do that I can't. And so this is a way that I feel like I can make a difference and, um, 
And then I really think that these people will go and encourage other people to do the same thing. I just think it, when you empower women, what is it? Empowered women, empower women. Is that what the phrase is? I mean, it just is like this lovely self-perpetuating cycle. All right. As fun as it's been, we're going to divide back into um, small groups. They're going to be different than the first time, but this is your assignment. You need to commit to your group members about what you're going to be writing on in the next week and where you're going to submit it. You're either, so, so there's actually three parts, your topic, whether it's going to be a letter to the editor or an opinion piece and where you're going to submit because commitment and accountability are important. How many minutes? Five? Yes. Yeah. Five minutes. And then when we come back, Susan, you can wrap up. Okay, sounds good. Here you go. Can I, I make one comment real quick? Please, um, please. Holly writes often different than like I do. I don't get into many of the controversial. I just push a little bit. I don't read comments either, but not all topics. Um, you need to be afraid of how people are going to react. Sometimes you just give them different topics. Yeah. Everybody writes in different ways. I don't want you to be scared to write. Um, um, but I, uh, yeah, I do kind of different topics a lot than Holly does. And we do, sometimes our purposes are similar and sometimes different. So everybody has their own voice and different kinds of things to write about. And Susan, when, when you're writing, you are representing sort of an institution. And so sure. you are not just speaking for yourself. So I remember when you and I were working on the one a couple of years ago, you had that brouhaha at Silicon Slope where like the guy wanted all the women to like clap for A-Rod or whatever it was. And as you and I were working on it, you were like, we are not even going to mention his name. We are not going to attack them or attack Silicon Slopes. We are going to talk about unconscious bias that led to this situation. So you used it as a way to kind of sideways call someone out, but really you used it as an opportunity to educate people. And, and that it's like this fine line, um, you know, that, that you have to work, that you have to walk being representing not just yourself. That's a good point. Thank you. All right, back to Holly or whoever's moving forward. Thank you for letting me pitch in there. <laughs> no, that's a really good reminder. I assume everybody is, you know, all hot under the collar all the time, and it's not actually true. <laughs> um, and I'm not hot under the collar all the time either. So yeah, uh, Susan's exactly right. You know, you, but you can write about research. You can write. All I'm saying is, I have seen um, that people can get offended by even the, the mildest, I think, of things, including talking about gender wage gap when you get people who say that's not real, it doesn't exist, right? And, and so you can talk about studies, you can talk about your own personal experience, you can talk about what snow plows have to do with data bias against women, mm -hmm. right? That's a, a super interesting as well. So we, are, we actually are open uh, for you guys. We want to take some time actually to have your questions, but we also wanna address, I think, some of the fears um, that people have. And so Heather, if you don't mind, I'll probably start with um, dealing with, um, I think, imposter syndrome. And th that's the idea that, that um, you're just a fraud, right? That who are you to have an opinion? Who are you to write to the paper or for the paper? Um, who are you to call people out? Anything. It, and it's it's not uncommon. It's, I think, gendered. I do think it's more common in women, but it is not exclusive to women. And, and it happens, I think, um, across multiple um, communities and organizations. So within the news organizations, within academia, within um, the legislature, there, there's, there are a lot of people who are stymied and stopped by um, imposter syndrome. And, mm -hmm. and I think the idea that Heather brought up earlier too is that you have to have things 100% right. Um, you don't, right? You, you don't have to be 100% um, in fact, nobody can know everything about everything. It's not possible, right? So you don't have to be an expert in tax policy to have an opinion on how taxes affect your family and going to the grocery store, right? You don't have to have um, some, some special insight or, or information um, 
to be able to have an opinion that can be a well thought out and, and well expressed opinion as well. And so, so imposter syndrome and perfectionism both, right, they can both be things that slow you down and stop you from moving forward. Like um, Heather mentioned earlier, I had somebody that I was working with and trying to coach along um, submitting an op-ed and we spent so much time and um, by we, I mean the original author, she sent it to so many people for input on how she could make it better that by the time she submitted it, it was way too late, right? We had missed our window. Um, for the story. And, and so, so, so part of it is that, and I think um, I just wanted to say one more thing about um, haters and then Heather gets to weigh in also and anybody else, I mean, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions, but, but I think um, you really have to be okay with people not agreeing with you. Right, that that's actually the sign of a mature adult. I think is that we can a, agree to disagree, but not everybody knows how to do that in a in a kind way, and and that's okay. I've had people send me personal letters to my home to call me out um, for articles that I've written. I've had um, nasty emails sent to me. I, I'm not hard to find, but it's it really is um, something that if you can learn to not take it personally, right? They don't know you. Um, they're usually, they don't know you. They're, they're not going to say that to your face. Um, and so it's, it's a way to say, okay, so if it was my neighbor who was saying this to me, what would I say to them? Right. If they were saying, I'll give you an example, a very short example. Our family has, um, we've adopted six children from Africa Black Lives Matter is an issue that we talk about in our house, right? Not all of our kids agree, not all of my neighbors agree. And so when I start to structure arguments, when I talk about why I support the movement, um, the, the idea that Black lives should matter, and uh, I do it from the, from the standpoint of what would I tell my kids who disagree, what would I tell my neighbor who disagrees, and how can I do it in a way that's kind, but still get my point across? Heather. So, so Holly, thank you for that. Um, the question I have for you, I watched a friend distantly go through some public scrutiny that was pretty difficult for her. She was a young mother and she wrote for actually a church publication and uh, she ended up just getting roasted. Can you speak a little bit to how you personally build that resilience so that you don't necessarily go through such a dark, deep spiral when people are aggressive toward you? Yeah, um, I can. I mean, one of the things that I, that I have been researching in a PhD program and it's because I've needed it is um, self-care and avoiding burnout. Right. And so it's those, it's those things that make us resilient. So it's personal practices, it's organizational structure. Is she, was she within an organization that had her back? If she was not, that's, you know, even harder. Um, but um, things like a practice of gratitude, it's not the surface stuff that really doesn't do a whole lot for um, actually filling the well in the way that we need it to but it's creating resilience. And so there's journaling that can happen. There's having a really tight knit group of people that you can trust to tell you the truth, even if it's hard sometimes. Yeah. Um, but they're the ones, you know, um, Brene Brown says, if you're not in the arena with me, you don't have the right to throw mud at me, right? And I'm not gonna listen to somebody who, who's not even getting their hands dirty, right? And there's, there are practices and sometimes it's life experience, but there are practices that include, like I think, like I said, journaling, um, gratitude, looking for friends. And, and then sometimes therapy is appropriate, right? Where you can start to weigh things out. If you have to go and ask somebody, is this right? Is this, is this true? Right? You need to be able to talk um, either to someone or even to yourself. And, and say what, what part of that might be true. Look, when I first started working in politics, the first time I was hired on a campaign, somebody called me a political whore, sorry for the language. And, and I, li like, I literally cried for half an hour and now it's like, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so sometimes that builds, but yeah, those practices of resilience and self-care can really, really be important. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. I think that if you get a lot of negative um, feedback 
um, you know, one positive way to spin it is, wow, I've, you know, kind of tapped into <laughs> something that's, that's really important. Um, and, and there have been times where things that I've, I've written, um, you know, I blog, that there have been ta a few times where I really got pushback and I had to do some self-examination and, and kind of think, okay, well, I didn't think about it from that point of view. And so those can be growth opportunities. Um, most of the times when we grow, suffering and pain are involved. I wish it weren't that way. <laughs> I wish that growth was always, you know, joyful and happy, but at least for me, and it's probably because I resist growth, um, it usually involves some type of um, <laughs> self introspection and, and maybe a little bit of um, rethinking and adjusting. So um, I want to talk now about how we as women can support each other and that it's our job to really be encouraging the people around us to have a voice, find their voice, use their voice. So one of, one of my favorite things that I ever learned from Susan, you know how sometimes you know something and then someone gives it a name and you're like, oh my gosh, thank you for naming that. So one of the things that Susan named for me is what she calls the tap, is that women in general need to be sort of tapped on the shoulder. And so I like this word, the tap, because it, it calls up this visual image for me. Tapped on the shoulder and said, hey, you're really good at that. Have you ever thought about, you know, and then fill in the blank with some way to magnify that ability or talent or skill. And, and so Susan does this a lot as a professor. Um, and if you're a parent, you know that you do that with your kids, you say, hey, you're really good at that. You really should take another class in computer programming. That's something that, that you're really good at. And, and so and women need it. We've, I talked about it a little bit before. Um, women need it a little bit more than men. And so as, um, as communities, we need to, when you're on Facebook or social media and you see someone write something that's really good, that really you're like, yes, that speaks to me. I think you have an obligation to, in the comments, say, this is really good. You should turn this into an op-ed or a letter to the editor or an essay. I think that, that we need to be encouraging each other. And as an individual who writes, I have to cultivate friendships and, and be around people who I know will in turn tap me and say, you know, Heather, you're, you're good at that. Maybe you should go back to school and, and do X, Y, and Z. And so I think that this, this notion of, um, of really encouraging each other, especially when it comes to writing, it is scary to write. I am 52 years old. I have been writing since I could hold a pencil. And it is still a little bit scary to put myself out there. I mean, you just kind of send it out there and you're like, oh my gosh, what, what's going to happen? You know, am I going to get hate mail or, you know, are people going to ignore it, which is probably even worse than, than haters is having, you know, crickets. Um, and so I think that, that we really have an obligation to support each other and to, and to validate each other. So if you want to write, you need to tell the people around you who support you and love you, say, I need you to encourage me. I need to hear it. Because for women, isn't it three times, Susan? Isn't it in general that three is the magic number? We'll go back to Schoolhouse Rock and remember that three is the magic number. So one tap, you're good at this. A second tap, hey, look at you. And a third tap, and it can be three taps from the same person or three different people. But women really need this reinforcement. And so, but you can't just sit around waiting for people to tap you. I think it's our job to, to seek it out and to find people who validate us, who, you know, who have, who know who we are, know our abilities, and who will encourage us to use our voices. So I think that's something that's, um, that's really important. If you want to write, I will be your cheerleader. I know Susan is always a cheerleader. I, I work with the um, Mormon Women for Ethical Government, their op-ed lab. You don't have to be a member of MWEG. 
I've helped men. I've like, I recently was helping a like retired general from Omaha write a letter and you just send it to opedlab at mwag.org and I will help you with, with your, um, with your writing, you know, get, getting it out there because people need to be validated and that's a real thing. It doesn't mean you're weak. doesn't mean you're needy. It's just the way it is. I think it's just, I thank you. Um, I think both of you, Holly and Heather, you've said some really important things. I think, you know, there's, there's pieces and I know you've talked about the different kinds of things in your small groups that you're thinking of writing, but there are definitely so many issues and so many things that need to be voiced that are not the same thing that are out there. And some of them are small and some of them are but they're still, they, they still matter to your community. So thank you for, for all that. Uh, do you have time, Holly and Heather, for a few more questions right now then? We do, and we actually have some really um, great questions in the chat. I've been trying to keep up and I think I might've missed a couple, but um, Elsie asked if it's important to know somebody on the inside of the news outlets and how much you need like a PR pitch person. It, it always helps if you know somebody, right? You can tag them or, you know, ask them to look into it, but you really don't need somebody on the inside and you really don't need a PR professional pitching you unless there's like, you've written a book and you really are trying to get that out in front of people and, you know, have a time to discuss. But, but I would say generally you don't. Um, Heather pointed out and several people. Let me, while she's frozen, share my screen for a second and show you where we have um, some of these links. So um, can you see this? Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. So um, over here on resources, so here's our homepage. And on resources, look over here. Do you see that? Submitting editorials. So you click on that. And, and I think we'll, we'll take on a project in the next couple of weeks. So we have links here for the Salt Lake Tribune, the Deseret News, the Daily Herald, and the St. George Spectrum. Um, but uh, so you, you know where they're at. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. Okay, so what I was saying is that women support women. And, and one of the things I think that's um, really important is that we amplify wherever we can, right? Is that we amplify other women. So, so really to what Heather was saying, in addition to saying, okay, look, you express that really well, you know, go ahead and submit that, or you should submit that, or can I help you write that up and submit that? Those types of things is that when they do um, submit it or they publish on Medium or they get it in something that you're able to share it on your social channels as well, right? And talk about, you know, hey, this is, this is an issue that's been important to me. I really love that, you know, that Heather wrote this, that Dr. Madsen is researching this, um, those types of things, yeah. So, yeah, so questions, jump in with more questions. Someone asked Heather, where did Heather go? There you are, you're over there now. To, can you put that email in the chat, Heather, that you, you said they could email? Did yes. you do that already? Absolutely. Okay. So I had a question, if I could jump in. Um, so <laughs> my question is, uh, have, have you ever had to change voice significantly? So for example, I have been published in my professional voice with some help from some, a colleague, but to publish like as me, as an individual, like, do you find it's really important to kind of change the voice or, cause Holly, I mean, I'm getting the impression you have definitely done that at least once, right? I have. A little bit of advice around how you adapt voice in that case. Yeah, I, I think academic writing is very different than writing for the popular press, right? And so it's, it's actually been a struggle for me to go writing from a 600 word column to I, you know, I'm trying to write a 6,000 word paper and I'm never trying, I'm trying to not use the word I, and it's like, oh, it's so different. So yeah, I think absolutely you can change voice. And one of the things you want to do um, is I, I think have some kind of a story or a hook. You, you do that a little less often in academic writing, although I think it makes it more interesting, but yeah, you absolutely can. Um, you, you can do that and it's totally fine to do it under your um, the same name, or it's fine for you to do it under a social media handle. Um, I've seen people who marry the two quite nicely and some who keep them quite separate and that's also okay. But yeah, you, it's totally fine and um, understandable to change voices. I have four active different voices depending on what I'm writing for. 
So, and each one changes. Um, I have a really scholarly vo uh, writing academic journal voice. I have a book voice that's fairly educated, but a little bit down from, but more citations. And then I have, uh, many of you have read the reports that we do, our snapshots, and, and that's a different voice. Um, and then editorials are a whole different voice. I probably have five voices, I should, but everyone is different. And when you're not used to, my students will say in my classrooms, like, I don't write like that. And I'm like, yes, you can. You, there are different voices within the same person and that still, they can be all authentic voices, yeah. but they're different depending on your audience. So sometimes, um, Sometimes it just takes a few times to practice and then you you kind of, it is more fun, can I just say, to write editorials than write really long, boring articles. It, it, it's more fun because you can just do stories and different things. So hopefully that's helpful. But. Thank you. So Marcy, um, asks, she says, I'm concerned about refugee and homeless issues. Besides writing about current events, is there a way to do an advocacy piece that isn't related to legislation or current events? So um, one of the things that, that Susan and I did is that um, I think it was last Pioneer Day, I really liked the piece that we put together that talked about uh, the pioneers coming, you know, taking this topical event, okay, Pioneer Day, I really wanted to hook it in with refugees because I work with refugees. And so we found a way to sort of dovetail and make this parallel between the very first pioneers were literally fleeing for their lives. And Salt Lake was this, was this refuge for them. And so we talked about that this is still the place um, for, and I don't think we got any legislation or any anything like no. that in. No, um, it was, yeah, it was good. But it was more about shifting the way people perceived refugees. It was our job in that piece was to get people to see themselves in the refugee, to, to find these commonalities. And so I think there are there are ways to do it. I mean, we're always taking like, if you look at a calendar of like holidays, events, like there's like National Donut Day. Like there, there is everything. And you can just look at these days and, and figure out what you want to talk about. And you can find some way to connect those two. And, and then that day is your relevant, like it's official um, pug awareness month, you know, or whatever it is. And then find a way to link it. I, donut, I think, donut day, seriously, Heather. There is, there is a national <laughs> No. Every day is donut day for some of us, but <laughs> yeah, I think I think if you look at um, the calendar, that's a good way to do it. I think you watch the news cycle; that's a good way to do it. But um, I, I certainly, it, it's a passion of mine as well, and I certainly would tie it into um, Thanksgiving coming up. Mm -hmm. um, I have written columns on uh, nonprofit organizations that do stuff with the homeless popular uh, population experiencing homelessness in Salt Lake around Thanksgiving and had people show up that read about it in the paper to go and serve meals on Thanksgiving day. Um, I've written about nonprofit agencies that, uh, help with refugee population. There's, there's lots of ways to tie it into the holidays and to giving and to, you know, to mother's day, think about what it would be like if, um, yes. or what it's like for, I mean, October, I think is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month and in Salt Lake. Anti-bullying month. And, right, and I think Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Breast cancer. A lot, there's a lot of things in October. Yep. And just this week, for example, we had a, a woman killed by her husband or stabbed, sorry, stabbed to death um, a day or two ago in Salt Lake County by her husband. Her children were there. Um, one of her children has, uh, is only seven years old and has a stab wound. Yeah. And so you can tie things in, you know, imagine that you're, you know, you're fleeing this kind of violence, those types of things, there are ways to tie that all in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What else? What other questions do you have before we do our next breakout, which is coming up actually? In one minute. Oh, actually, we're good. 
One minute. Okay, so what we're gonna do in this next section is we're actually dividing the group into half and Heather will be on half and I'll be in half. And we are really just gonna talk about op-eds, but we are there to answer your questions about writing, starting how to write, how to submit, any of the questions you have about yeah. um, I would, the I would really, opinion pieces. I would really prefer it to be a discussion. So it come yeah. with questions, because that I think that's that's the best way. You have 30 seconds to think of questions. And then yeah. we can come back together as a big group. And then we have one small breakout um, okay. where we want people to commit and then one final wrap up. Okay, I'll put you in for 20 then. Here you go. Hey. Okay, anyone, I, th I think our group's not too crazy. We can probably, anyone have any question that they, that they want to ask. So one of the things that that while we're working that out, um, Heather, all probably, hmm? can I ask a question that maybe yeah. might be helpful? So if you were to just start, like, if, what is a good way to always start out an op-ed? Is it like um, I I can't remember if it was you or Holly that said start out with a story? So do you just plan like, it, what's a surefire way to always start? That might well, be. okay, so I've got a little list here. Um, so one way to do it is, um, so it says a news hook is what makes your piece timely and it's often part of the lead. Be bold, but incontrovertible. Tell an anecdote if it illustrates your point. Use humor if appropriate. So here's some real world examples. So you can use the news. So you can take something topical. So this Wednesday evening, Francis Newton 40 will be put to death for the murders of her husband and two children 18 years ago. So that's first sentence, it links it with something current and it would give you a launching off point to talk about either, I don't know, whatever it is that they wanted to talk about. Um, you could tell a dramatic anecdote. So here's another one that I pulled. 10 years ago, I asked Bosnian civilians under siege in Sarajevo where they would go if they could escape. So that's, that's another one that kind of you want sort of right off the bat um, to give people a little bit of feel for what you're talking about and also try to make it interesting. I like the anniversaries a lot. So here's another one. 50 years after the Supreme Court banned school segregation, the battle over racial composition of America's school continues in courtrooms across the country. So you can take an anniversary and, and then find a way to make it applicable. So another good way to open is you can cite a major new study. So according to a new nationwide poll, 60% of women had cheated on their husbands at least once. You know, so you can start out with something like that. Um, Holly had mentioned the, um, the snowplow one. Um, and, and so our title for that one that we wrote about was, have you heard the one about the sexist snowplow? Because we just thought, okay, that's, it just sounds crazy. It's going to, you know, pull people in. And so then we immediately started talking about this group in Sweden that, um, that they were trying to, the bosses were trying to implement more diversity and gender sensitivity into the town. And, and one person in the town said, well, you know, at least we don't have to worry about clearing snow because it's not like a snowplow can be sexist. And so uh, then they did some research and it turned out that it was in fact sexist that all the major roads were cleared first, making way for um, the full-time workers, mostly men who would go from home to work and back, whereas the women had these chain travel because they drop the kids off at daycare and then they'd go visit, um, you know, take the prescription to their mother and then they'd go to work and then they'd do this thing. And those, they found that when they plowed the sidewalks and those streets, first, when they plowed it for, for women, that it actually saved the town more, twice as much money as they were spending on snow removal. Because people were getting hurt, people were getting injured, it was costing the town all sorts of money. Um, and so, anyhow, so the, citing a recent study can be a good way to get into things. So I wanna ask Susie, because we've got Susie Angerbauer over here, she writes a lot. Susie, how do you, when you're writing something, how do you figure out what your intro is going to be? Hey, unmute. You have to. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. I was thinking a lot about that as you were talking because 
I feel like it's the start that stops me, right? It's always the start that stops. So if you can, if I have an idea of what I'm going to write about, I don't worry at all about exactly how I'm going to start it. I start writing the, the everything body. I know about I, the body I do, like, that's what I start with. And I feel like as I get going mm -hmm. in the piece, usually towards the end of me being ready, then I'm like, oh, this is what the start should be. A lot of time the start that ends up going at the top was in the middle somewhere, right? So yeah. I, I think that you don't let not knowing how you're going to start it prevent you from starting to write. Yes. I mean, I think that's, that parallels with the perfection thing is that yeah. a lot of times we don't do things because they're not going to be perfect and you don't know how to start. And that's where brainstorming is a good idea or just writing down you know, what you think your main points could be, because sometimes you do really have a good idea of what, you know, the meat is going to be, but you're not sure. And How I, they, I yeah. often have five different intros. I'll have yeah. several different intro sentences, like outfits that I lay out on my bed and mm -hmm. then kind of try them on and be like, I oh, know that one doesn't really work. Or this one looks really cute, but I can't move in it. I don't have anywhere to go from here. Yeah. And so then now, another I'll, thing. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing is um, about sitting on it for a few minutes. Often I will have worked on it for a long time and then I'm in a shower or I'm about to go to sleep and it, it hits me what the beginning should be. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I call that percolating. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. and I have started to bill people for when sometimes when I'm driving, if I'm driving and I spend a good half hour kind of working through all that stuff in my head, I'm like, that's time. Like I'm billing that. Oh yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. I oh, see some sure. other people who were like, absolutely. <laughs> you know? So, um, because it's, it's, it's often when you sit down and write, that's the culmination of all this other stuff that's gone on. And then it, you know, it comes together. So, um, gosh, it still won't let me screen share. So I'll, I'll, I think I'm going to try to go. I wonder if I can, email. Well, whatever. I'm just going to. So recently, um, Susan and I did one on domestic violence because again, you know, it's October is domestic violence month. And so we, we really wanted one. And I was talking with my 14 year old daughter. She's like, what are you doing? I said, oh, I've, I've got to go. I've got to go get in a good place because if you're writing about, <laughs> about some of these topics are heavy. And so I'm like, I've got to kind of, you know, get myself in a good place because I have to write about domestic violence. And, um, and she said, oh, you should use some, she mentioned some song. And I'm like, well, what song is that? She goes, well, it's a song based on another song. I'm like, okay, well, help me out. She goes, well, it's the, the song it's based on is called, he hit me and it felt like a kiss. I'm like, okay, that is horrifying, but beautiful at the same time. And so I sat down and Googled it and it's a song that Carol King wrote. Carol King who's written like 50 million songs. And she had a babysitter who was little Eva. Who's the, the, the woman who ended up doing that song locomotion. I don't know if anyone's ever come on baby, do the local. It was like a big hit in the sixties and then redone in the seventies for those of us who are uh, of that generation. And she came home and little Eva, her babysitter, was black and blue. And she said, what's going on? And she says, well, it's my boyfriend. And she's like, why do you stay? And she goes, well, he hits me because he loves me. And that's what the, that's where the song came from. And so I decided that I would start the op-ed out with that, with that phrase and kind of give, give the little background. Um, but then you have to make it applicable. And, and so I, my sort of thesis statement says, almost 60 years later, the problem of domestic abuse persists. In fact, one in three Utah women will experience some form of domestic violence in her lifetime. And our rate is slightly higher than the national average. So, um, and then the next paragraph is basically answering the question, why does this matter here and now? And I think that most op-eds sort of deal with that, especially if you're, you're trying to change something. So you've raised some issue, here's a problem, and then you say, why does this matter here and now? And I, that's where you can give some good statistics. 
Um, I bring in the pandemic that the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition numbers uh, are 25 to 50% higher calls for domestic and intimate par partner violence across the state so far that this pandemic is really making it worse. So it matters here in Utah and it matters right now because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then in the next paragraph, I explore a little bit the definition of domestic violence, that it's not just hitting, there's emotional, verbal, financial, spiritual abuse, sexual abuse. And then um, Susan has some personal examples of people that she's close to. So we put those in there because you want something personal. You want people to have a sense of immediacy. And so then the next paragraph, I sort of put my head in people's, I try to put my mind into readers' heads. And so then in my mind, I'm thinking, readers are probably thinking at this point, why don't you just leave? If you're, you know, in this domestic violence, like you want to anticipate people's objections. Why are people going to say that this problem you say is a problem either isn't a problem or could just be solved? And so then I quote this statistic that um, statistics show that 70% of domestic violence murders happen after the victim has left. So these women are, are right to be afraid to leave because it really does increase their chance of being killed if they leave. And so, and then others are so emotionally traumatized that they lose all sense of self-worth. They believe they somehow deserve it. And like Carol King's babysitter, they come to equate abuse with a warp kind of love. So, you know, next I've answered the objections. And then when it comes to hard stuff like this, none of us want to think that this could happen to us. Everyone, whenever you hear something that's happened bad to someone, we always try to rationalize, well, I never would have walked down that dark alley at night, so that never would happen to me. We all want to kind of come up with reasons why, why we're safe. And so, um, so here, I try, I, I say, you know, while there's a lot of num there are a lot of factors that can have an impact on the risk. So the less education you have, um, your income, all of these things can increase domestic violence. But the truth is that it can happen to anyone. Like it, it really, there's no way for us to ever say, this isn't a problem for me and my, my friends. So um, then if you go down this road, you're dealing with a problem, you're showing why people should care, why it could potentially affect them. I think that you have a, a responsibility to you don't want to leave people feeling helpless. I think that hope is a much greater motivator than being feeling helpless. So at that point in the op-ed, it's my job as the writer to let people know that there's something you can do. Um, and, and not just we as a community, but you as an individual. So here I give a link to Stop Violence, Stop the Violence Utah. It's an organization that focuses on education, prevention, and advocacy. So if people were interested, they could become one of the people who answers the phones and helps people. And then I talk about some of the resources that the U of U has so that people don't feel hopeless. Because if you're hopeless, you can't change. Because you're just like, what's the point? So, um, and then for the end, I think it's nice, you need to close with an ask, so kind of reinforce that you want people to do something. And if you can tie it back in to some of the themes that you've talked about or back into the intro, that's a really nice way, that's where like the English major in me really comes out, where I want it to kind of have this nice little bow, I wanna package it. So for my closing, it says, ultimately, we need to look out for neighbors, friends, sisters, and daughters, and be a safe haven. I am reminded of another Carol King song, You've Got a Friend, that shows what real love looks like. Now, ain't it good to know that you've got a friend when people can be so cold? They'll hurt you, yes, and desert you. And take your soul if you let them, but don't you let them. And then the final line is, please be a friend. So that's sort of one way um, that you can go through through something. Again, start with this introduction, make a connection, um, show why it's a problem here in, in Utah or wherever you are, 
um, give some evidence and personal examples, um, anticipate objections, again, show why this matters to the reader, why they should care. Again, even if it's not their, their issue, you need to make people care. You need to show them why they should care and then give people ways to help. Don't leave people fe feeling helpless. I mean, sometimes I, I'll be working on an op-ed and I'll get to the end and it's like, I, I don't know, I don't even know, like it's so <laughs> depressing, like I don't know, but you've got to find a way to, to give people hope and let people feel like, come away from it wanting to do something, wanting to create change. So, all right, other questions? Heather, can I get you to expand a bit on um, anticipating and answering arguments to yeah. your, your op-ed? Because that is my downfall. I will anticipate every single, <laughs> every single thing, and I start answering them, and all of a sudden, I'm at 2,000 yes. words. All of a sudden, you have disappeared. You're not there anymore, mm -hmm. and, and you're just, you know... Because you can get defensive and you can let that and, you know, and I think that writing everything out is sometimes a really good, um, a good way to do it. So when people send stuff in to me at the op-ed lab, I would say that let's, they, people will send something and it's almost a thousand words. People tend to, to overwrite and, and over deal with objections. And I end up slashing usually at least half of it. And so you just go through it and you think of these five examples that I have, which is the best one? Which, you know, and then you take that one and then you expand it and, and make it really tight. Because you don't, there's no way to answer every objection. There's, there's just no way. So you need to go through it. And sometimes it's helpful to have someone else look at it because other people might say, this is the one, I think this is your, your argument. This is, you know, this is the objection that you really need to deal with. Um, and a lot of times when I'm writing for myself and looking at other people's writing, it'll be about three paragraphs in that I'll put a star by it and say, this is where your, your paper starts. That, that sometimes you just have to kind of do the throughout history and kind of give this big picture that, you know, we all kind of, we have that funnel idea of writing, but here you've, you've got to really just launch. You've got to, you've got to launch in and, and get started. Okay. So I'm going to share with you a few emails. They're very brief um, from, this is, this is, one end of an exchange I had with someone. So she sent, she, she lives in Las Vegas. She sent in an op-ed that she really felt passionate about. And so here is, here's the first, her first email to me. Some women in the Nevada chapter of MWEG encouraged me to write an op-ed. They said to send it to you for help. I haven't done anything like this since I wrote editorials for my high school paper 30 years ago. It was a good exercise and it challenged me on many levels. Please be brutally honest and willing to accept whatever changes. I'm also willing to scratch the whole thing if you think it's garbage. So this first paragraph, she's basically saying, I am terrified. I feel totally naked. I have not done this in years and it's okay if you hate it, you know, because somehow it makes it easier to take the rejection if you, you know, say I'm, I'm cool with rejection, <laughs> but it's always hard. So then I emailed her back, lots of editing back and forth. And then the, her second email then says, I'm very pleased with how this has turned out. Switching sentences did help with the transition. I'm having a hard time deciding whether to send it to the Las Vegas Sun or the Nevada Independent. I think the Sun gets a larger local readership but the Independent may get a larger readership statewide. I would go look at my uh, metrics, who was looking, right? And at the end of my first week, I think I had like eight views. <laughs> right? and, and it just, but it just grew because I was consistent, but yeah, you just keep going. Some things will resonate and some things won't. And sometimes it'll go back around and you're like, oh, I could revisit that, yeah. Holly, talk a little bit about the strengths of the op-ed. Why, why is that a, I mean, it's not very long. If you don't have a lot of time, maybe that's the best. Uh, you know, what's really good about it, maybe what's not as strong about it. Would you talk about that for just a minute? Yeah, sure. So, so one of the, one of the things is the reach, right? So 
it, people like to see things that were published somewhere besides maybe Facebook, although not always. I mean, it can be influential there. But, but I think one of the things that you can do is, A, it forces you to hone your arguments so that you can get down and, and really um, concise in why some issue is important. So whether that's domestic violence or clean air or voting, whatever it is, right? It helps you force, uh, it helps force you to be really clear in your writing and concise, right? So I think that's one of the advantages. I think one of the disadvantages is that it's, it's kind of like the one minute answer in a, a, a debate. You really can't get into any kind of depth you can't really get into any strong policy discussion. You really can't have a back and forth in an op-ed. I mean, you can do some back and forth with dueling op-eds, but that's not the most effective way to have a dialogue. But it kind of puts information out into the public space and it can be a conversation starter. What Thank recommendations you. would you have about starting a caregiver's blog? You mentioned blogs, so then that kind of uh, thought yeah. process, yeah. Well, um, the, the advice that I would have about any kind of blog um, is A, you have to be really consistent. B, it doesn't have to be super complicated, right? There are all kinds of ways you can even uh, type stuff on your phone now and upload. Um, there's lots of different media, meaning um, writing, pictures, video, vlogging, which is video blogging. There's all kinds of ways um, I think to get the word out there. So you can, you can switch that up with a caregiver blog. You could do a podcast. A lot of people are listening to podcasts right now um, because they can do it while they're doing other things. Um, and I think that's something that would be really popular, but consistency, especially at the beginning, consistency to get you started so people know where to go um, to find that information is really important. Should you have your own website prior to that perhaps? Um, yeah, I mean, if you're committed to doing something long term, I would. Uh, if you're if you're not, I think medium.com is a place where it like it houses things and that can be a really good place to go. Um, what I would recommend you not do is start a blog underneath somebody else's site. So for example, WordPress mm -hmm is a free site, but your email address or your website address will have wordpress.com at the end of it. You don't mm -hmm. want that. What you want is hollyrichardson.org, not hollyrichardson.wordpress.com, right? So, so if you're gonna go to the effort to create a website, just make sure that you pay for hosting so that you have your own website. Yeah. Excellent. What else? When you bring up when you bring up a, a topic in an op-ed, do you then follow up with more of that like on a blog? Um, just because you're you're just giving, like you said, it's like a one minute yeah. argument about something in a call to action. But I would assume that people want to know more information. Do you offer that? Sometimes. It, it really depends. So sometimes I do and sometimes I don't actually. So if you follow on my social media, a lot of times Twitter is where I will have a lot of additional either resources or, you know, for the Black Lives Matter movement has been something that's kind of threaded throughout this last year for me. And so I've had several columns on that. I just did one for additional resources um, where people can go to find out additional information. But I also retweet a lot of other people um, on a lot of other arguments, but I, a lot of times I don't go back and revisit previous um, articles. Sometimes I do, but uh, generally I don't. It's interesting. Uh, following up on that, uh, if you post something and or you get an op-ed in, and if you put it at the bottom of it, you know, like for more information on this op-ed or for follow-up on this op-ed, you can go to Holly. Yeah. Org. Do the newspapers, they're okay with that? Like, cause you're, you're kind of advertising for yourself. Um, I haven't done that myself. Um, referring back to me, I have linked to previous articles that I've done, but I do know some people who write um, and submit at the Deseret News and they're doing it actually to build their business. And so it's right in there, right? For more information, you can go here for, you know, to set up a coaching call, you can go here. So, so it, I, I think they would, um, 
uh, like if you're a political candidate, you can have your website in there and just say, you know, look, this is just barely touching an issue. But for more information, you can go to my website here. You can do that and they'll let you know if they're going to strip it out. But yeah. Okay. What else? And how, how quickly hmm? have you gotten, or like, what's the range of response time that you get that it will be posted? Because you, you mentioned I, that. Because I'm in a different boat, so I uh, I'm not as familiar actually. So, so when I've worked with other people and I'm submitting like as a ghostwriter or you know helping to get things placed, it's usually about a three day lead time, three to four day. So if I want it in the Sunday paper, I have to have it in by Wednesday at five. Um, if you want it by Thanksgiving, if you've got something really pertinent to Thanksgiving, they may or may not publish on Thanksgiving day. So think about if they publish it a day before, is it still pertinent? And if it is go backwards. And then I would probably go to the Friday before, right? There are people who will read emails on Saturday and Sunday, but a lot of times they get lost. So I would go during business hours and I would have it submitted by like the Friday before, if you're trying to get it in, um, for Thanksgiving specifically Christmas time, you've got the whole month of December. Right, those types of things, but give it, you're going to give it several days of lag time. Yeah. Do you think that's true even in the digital world? Do you think it hasn't really changed much? In the what world? It, it, bearing in mind, a lot of, of press is now completely digital. So it's not a case yeah. of waiting for a print run. Is, is the time lag still about the same? Well, um, not necessarily, but I know that the editor at the Salt Lake Trib for me, um, if I let him know that I'm not going to submit that week, he actually has a pool of things that have been submitted that have just been kind of sitting in the hopper. So I'm sorry, everybody, but, <laughs> but, but it may be, it may be a few days. I would still say, yeah, they planned because even though, um, I think it's new too, that they're shifting away from print because they've been downsizing, but now they're going to go away from it completely by the beginning of the year. But but what they're going to do, I think, is that you still have layout, you still have photographs, you still have to, you know, have it set up, you know, and typeset those. It's not typeset anymore. It's digitally designed, but they do need some time to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's a real barn burner of an issue and you've got something that you can, you know, whip off and get off to them right away, they're going to maybe have 20 submissions and maybe they're going to pick five and they'll publish them right away. I mean, you'll see stuff online today about um, Senator Lee's comments yesterday. That's already up there. Okay. I have a question for you. Um, I'm, I'm probably less interested in publishing controversial and argumentative pieces, but um, I've been thinking, yeah, maybe I should start a blog or maybe a podcast about, you know, some of the areas of expertise I've had, and like uh, women and money. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. There. Yeah. Um, right now, right now, like you, I'm working on my PhD at the U in um, biomedical informatics, specifically patient uh, shared decision making. So, you know, I could do, so, yeah, the, it's a lot of work. Um, but, you know, just a lot of what we focus on there is about providers and clinicians and how do they get involved. But honestly, I want to reach the patients. I want yep. to help people to think about, oh, here's what I could do to go and kind of meet meet the clinician halfway. I mean, maybe that's more technical than. No, I it, look, I mean, it, you could you could do a blog, you could do a podcast, you could do a series. But I, I could even see that kind of information in the in, in a paper, right, in a traditional media context. Mm -hmm. it, and this is writing for the popular press, but you could also mm -hmm. be going on TV, you could be doing, you know, KSL. <laughs> and, uh, you could, right? Because, because what I'm saying is, you could do something that's like, here are the top 10 questions you need to be asking your doctor. And people yeah. will eat that up, right? And you yeah. are correct. It's not controversial, right? But super yeah. helpful. And, and yep. especially if you can put that human aspect of it, um, mm -hmm. maybe so, so for example, my second child was born with disabilities and I was young, my husband and I were young and we didn't know what to ask. We didn't know where to go. We were completely overwhelmed with, um, grief and with this whole life-changing thing. And it would have been super helpful if somebody had said, Hey, let me hold your hand through this process. Let me help mm -hmm. you know how to, to navigate this. And, and there's always going to be an audience for something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And anytime there's something, some way you can tie that into national news or local yeah. news, I mean, healthcare is in the news right now. You can even tie it into the pandemic somehow, you know, here are top 10 questions to ask your doctor on your video call, right? Something like that. But yeah, I think it's great. 
So where would I aim that towards the popular press? I mean, I get the idea of a blog or a, a podcast, but I mean. Le uh, an op-ed. Yeah. Op-ed. Op okay. Yeah. Okay. And you could have in your head, you could have a series, right? But you can do, you absolutely could do, uh, you know, look, medicine is changing. Um, we mm -hmm. know that the pandemic has uncovered some weaknesses, but it's also revealed some opportunities. And here are some things that, that I have found that are really helpful to people in the decision-making process, whatever is how you set it up. Right. But yeah, absolutely. Cool. Uh, okay. Thanks. Send it in. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Okay. Okay. What else? Um, Thanks, do you Jerry. get paid for any of your op-ed pieces? Um, I know you're sort of more regular and you've been doing this forever. So I, I get assume paid. you probably do get paid, but I, I do get paid. <laughs> But I also know people who have written for a different outlet and it was all volunteer for five years. Don't do yeah. that. Same. And I don't even know how to like, approach that. You know, will they say it on their, like, you can submit here, you will get paid or won't get paid? Or do they tell you, hey, we're going to print this? I don't know of anybody locally that pays for submissions that they're not out recruiting. And even if they do recruit, a lot of them still aren't paying. Um, I understand the New York Times does pay for submissions, but their process is, you know, very rigorous um, and they don't pay a lot. It's, I, I just was looking it up online today. It's like 150 bucks a couple of years ago. So it's not like you're going to make a lot of money. Um, and I don't make a lot of money. <laughs> um, it's, but, but um, it's really, I, I think the opportunity is that you get your name out there and you get known and then you have opportunities outside of publishing in the paper, um, some kind of a, a, as a column, you know, or an op-ed, a regular op-ed contributor. But most of them, um, unless you're specifically hired by the newspaper, they're not gonna pay you for your columns. Um, but yeah, if you do a blog, you can have advertising on your blog. But again, I mean, same with a podcast, you can have advertising if you can get to it, but that's after you already have readership. Mm -hmm. So my, what I'm saying is don't count on it. <laughs> yeah. So. Like um, you guys have a way to collect data better than most of us um, in the regular public. Cause I feel like I stay current, but then things come up that are very detailed with numbers and graphs and percentages. And is there a central place people as journalists go to look for that kind of stuff or um, do they have to do their own research and it's haphazard or how does that? So work? the answer is kind of yes. And I'm not a journalist, I'm a columnist. There is a difference. So I don't, I don't have to have the same kind of sourcing that a journalist does as they're writing articles. But I think it's my academic training that has led me to, you know, being able to read maybe an academic study and translate it into something that's that's interesting for people to read. Um, it's helped me to read that way. But I'm just a voracious reader, right? So I um, and I read and consume news like I think a lot of people today on my phone, right? I don't watch the TV news. I don't. Uh, maybe this is a problem. I don't read the print newspaper <laughs> and I have it for years. Um, I just do it all online. And so I, I get information that way. But, but when I have a question or I'm trying to do additional research, then I'm on the computer doing additional research. I want to see, I want to see the actual study, right? I don't want to see somebody who said, well, somebody one time said this, this, and this. I want to see where is it that they wrote about that? Is it a Pew research study? Is it um, somebody who just called a few neighbors and called it a study, right? I mean, there's all kinds of different ways to kind of look at that. But again, you can't know everything about everything. And so if you've got a particular area that you're interested in, then you're going to follow the people that are the most interested and the most um, probably the most research oriented in that area in a way that's interesting to you, right? There are a lot of people in academics that I find incredibly boring and I don't <laughs> I don't really want to follow them because it's like, can you please use like normal words? Just use normal words. <laughs> Actually, here's a silly question, but when you're sourcing like that and you know, your op-ed piece, 600 words, bang on, yeah. but you referred to a pure research study or whatever, do you in the writing itself, do you hyperlink to it? I do. Or do you put it as a footnote? So no. some sub editor is going to fix that for you? 
No, I hyperlink it. I hyperlink it and I send it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, you you know, look, sometimes the academic studies are behind paywalls. And so you'll rarely get the abstract of it. And, and that's fine, but there's other places that people have written about it, but, but yeah, I hyperlink it. Yeah. Even if it was to something where someone would only get the abstract. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. And, and so here's, here's a slightly more controversial question. I asked it about changing voice, but maybe it's imposter syndrome as well, is how do you deal with the worry that you write an opinionated piece, the opinion in our fad, but it's not. Right. right. Like somebody kind of deciding you are a mega hypocrite. Like how dare you write about this? Not about expertise as such, but like, for example, the classic one is refugees are a huge issue. We should be welcoming people who want to contribute to blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, are you opening your house up to one? Do I see you down the that's what I mean of like yeah. people going after you yeah. on a person. I mean, case, you've done the answer, politics, yes. so <laughs> <laughs> you've got a tough skin, right? But yeah, yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. And I wouldn't be, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily take an approach where it felt like I was lecturing somebody. Right. But I do have skin in, in that particular game. Right. And I have worked with refugees internationally. And so I share my own experience when I do it. But what I haven't done, for example, is I haven't done a lot of work with um, populations experiencing homelessness and mental illness, right? And so I can write about that, but it's a little bit different because I'm talking about here are some options and here are some things we need to think about and here are some of the the problems. But I'm not I'm tr- not trying to come at it from a perspective of saying I have the answers. I think the same thing is we're, we're seeing it with um, when we talk about um, racism, right? Well. Mm-hmm if we're talking about white privilege and it, it it can really make some people upset, right? And it can really be like, well, you're a white woman. How dare you talk to me about that? And, and my response is I'm trying to learn and I'm trying to do the best I can to make sure that people, that I use my voice for people who can't use theirs, right? Mm-hmm. And as a mom of black children, a white mother of black children, I have a different perspective and a different way to voice that than some other people do. And yet I'm also have to be aware of my own privilege and my own positionality, right? Where we're looking at populations of color because they're, some of their life experience is totally different than my own. We have 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> that was an awesome answer though. <laughs> Thanks. There was a slide about submission steps I missed that somehow, I guess I was so caught up in the conversation. Uh, Where shall we find that afterwards? Will the recordings be archived or to read? Yes, we can have Susan send you the whole slide deck, but it's basically look up the information online and submit it electronically. How did it go? Pretty good? Fast. Are you committed? (laughs) <laughs> oh so, well okay some of you are a little more energetic than others some of you are like the deer in headlights uh, <laughs> but uh but i'm excited that you're all here did you have anything else holly and heather as as you conclude? yeah i would i would say um we actually so on the slideshow it has um our contact information in fact if you don't mind i'd like to share that again really quick if i can do that Um, It has our contact information, but one of the things that I would really like to encourage you to do, um, see, we had to do this. This is why I had to show you. It's (laughs) Heather and Holly Hobby. Oh, do you guys, we're, that ages us, right? It dates us, but, but this is our contact information. And I would really love for you to let me know if you do submit and if it gets published, I will share it. So that's your commitment from me, right? Is I would really like you to go ahead and follow through with this. This is the, okay, I missed it. The, the commitment piece is that, is that we hold ourselves accountable to do the things that we say are important to us, okay? Yeah, and, that was it. And so, uh, we would share it too. So yeah, let us know. So yeah. I've got a few parting words. Number one, if you're too scared to write, find a friend. I have had several people come to me and want to write something and I write it with them. And I think that's a really good way to get your feet wet the first time is, is write it with a friend. Um, and then I just, so 
If you're published and it's online, share it on social media. Your issues will get more attention. You're modeling civic responsibility to your friends who may follow your lead. And the validation that you get from doing it is going to make you more willing to do it again. And even if it's not published, you still get brownie points for being brave. And once you have something written down, you are more likely to share your ideas with people around you. So if, if I could kind of give you one final sentence, it's writing can change the world, but just as important, it can change you. That was so profound, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh, I'm so glad to have all of you join. Thank you for being on the camera. And um, I think this was, this was important to help unleash more women's voices in the state of Utah. And as I said, you know, our, our, the reason we put on this and other events is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. And I truly believe that as we do that, we also strengthen families and we also strengthen our schools and our communities and, and I've always believed that when women are stronger, we can also lift boys and men as well. So I hope you'll, you'll stay with the commitment uh, that you've made, hopefully, in your groups of three um, to move forward. And Heather's given you some, you know, she really is serious she, and she's very good at, at coaching. So I would like to give a special thanks to Holly and Heather. Uh, I love the doll slide. <laughs> that was so great. Yes, thanks so much for that today. Thank you so much again for your support and for being here and hopefully it helped and uh, maybe one more round of applause for Heather and yeah, I like that. <laughs> or the little smiley faces or whatever. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful evening.